Good morning. At your tables, uh, there's some copies of, as you mentioned a moment ago, our senior adult schedule for the year. I'm still doing a couple little tweaks to that, but that's basically what we're going to be working with. We'd love for you to head out uh, this summer with us to Texas, out at the, in, in the canyon and outside of Canyon, Texas. Uh, have not been there as many times as I have Branson, but uh, been there many times. And uh, going to be heading to San Antonio together in the fall. Uh, going to have a great progressive dinner that our young adults are putting on for you this summer. But uh, one of the big events coming up, uh, mark it on your calendar in April, is our spring fling. Look at your calendar and tell me what the date on that is. April the what? Oh, it's May? Okay. Is it May 4th? Is that the correct date? May 4th? Is that what your calendar says? Okay. Well, I'm going to be ready for you at the end of April. That'd be all right. I'll have the goats ready. I just can't wait to turn Roscoe out. You know, last year some of you held the little baby goats. This year they're going to be headbutting you with their horns. So I'm excited about turning them out for you. We'll do that right before you leave. Uh, last thing, because they're not potty broken, and they have to watch out for them. But anyway, we'll uh, talk more about the schedule uh, as we uh, get a little closer to some of these events. Your game nights will be resuming. We'll start off here in a couple of weeks with breakfast night, and uh, I'll be doing most of all the cooking for you again this year and driving on a number of the trips. Don't know if I can get to all of them, but I will try to be on most of those trips and looking forward to you. would love for some of you to join us. It's always exciting for us, for some of you that don't typically go on trips. We got old Fred to go on a trip last year. He, he, look, look at him. He, he gets his lip pooched out. I'm not going anywhere. And we carried him to eat barbecue, and he loved it. In fact, he bossed me on how to drive the whole way over and all the way back. But uh, anyway, I think we got Fred convinced that, you know, we're not bad people around here. But uh, pick out some of those trips if you don't normally go, little day trips. We're going to head over in the spring, look at some plants and eat lunch, do some stuff around Tyler. If you want to start out with a small little day trip, do that. But we will, we'll be uh, furnishing you information as we go along. Uh, again, Pastor, why do you mess with the seniors? You put energy into my life. You help recharge my batteries. You let me wear my boots and drive and uh, type on my computer while I drive the bus and talk on my phone and all those things. No, you know we don't do that. But uh, thank you for putting into our lives. How many of you had a chance to tell Pastor Kevin he really looks old now? If you haven't done that, be sure you stop by and tell Pastor Kevin, man, Oakland Heights Baptist Church is aging you or something. But just really get on him about turning 60 and uh, remind him when you see him, Boy, our pastor, man, he still, man, he just keeps on going. He's in his prime, man. He's looking great. And Pastor Kevin, you're just looking older and older. I want you to really tell him that now and get on to it. Grab your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've got just a couple little things to tie up on our introduction. If you're here and haven't been here or you missed last week, we've got some extra outlines. Pastor Mike's walking around giving those out. And so be sure you get one of those. All we had time to do last week was just kind of get started on some introductory material. And uh, just, just want to kind of go back there and do just a quick review. Those little bullets at the top of your outline, this is information that will be significant to us as we tear into these verses. What a privilege to be dealing with Romans 8 on Sunday mornings and 1 Corinthians 15 on Wednesdays. I mean, two of the fantastic chapters uh, I shared with our congregation uh, Sunday morning. A number of scholars say Romans 8 is the greatest chapter in all the Bible. And, uh, you know, a lot, lot of debate about that, but certainly there are a number of scholars that say there's no greater than Romans 8. Well, one thing we can say with certainty, without speculation, is 1 Corinthians 15 is the most exhaustive chapter in all the Bible that deals with the resurrection. And it really deals with it in three tenses, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But go back and this is just a real quick boom, boom, boom review of what we looked at last week on this uh, beginning material. A reminder of the culture of Corinth. Corinth was a what? A problem child. The church in Corinth, the problem child. And what was their big issue? 
the world kept infilling. It kept infiltrating, and they were bringing all the junk of the world with them into the church. And it began to cause significant problems. In a nutshell, that was their culture. It wasn't so much that they created problems as they were inviting problems. <laughs> they were transferring the problems from their local communities, from Roman authorities, and they were bringing those things into the church. That second thing, we talked about two kind of different outlooks on 1 Corinthians 15. It is the only doctrinal chapter in all of 1 Corinthians. Everything else is more what? An application. It's dealing with some narrative event, some problem. Well, what, what's the role of women? And what's the role of spiritual gifts? Or whatever it is. And Paul was pinpointing these different problems. When you come to the 15th chapter, we said two ways to look at that is finally... Paul gets to return to his pattern of writing where he likes to deal with doctrinal issues. Or, really, we could look at that in the sense that this is just another problem. <laughs> and he builds the doctrinal issues in behind dealing with that problem, which happens to be the church at Corinth did not believe in bodily resurrection. Not for Jesus. We'll talk about that in a moment. But they didn't believe that when they died there would be any forthcoming of a bodily resurrection with their return to Jesus. And again, where did that infill from? From what? Grecian life. It infilled from that Roman authority, that leadership around them. That's where that came to play. The third little thing was, what about the dating? And I said, just as a reminder, this was written, we think, in about in late 54, early 55. Think about it. It was at that moment when the letter was released, the only known work on the resurrection. When the church at Corinth, that letter began to unfold and be read to them and explained and expounded upon, it, at that moment in 55 AD, the only recorded real teaching from a doctrinal standpoint on the resurrection. Why? Because Mark didn't come along until almost six years later in terms of his writing, we think that was probably early 60 or 61. Luke followed, and we, we think that's probably 65. And then uh, you know, Matthew came along even after that, around 69. And then we know that the last man standing was John. We think John finally got his, his gospel written in about 83 A.D. And so this was really a precursor. This was a forerunner to give information, and it still speaks to us in, in a commanding way. The fourth thing, we just quickly looked at a little outline. We said, here's a simple way to outline 1 Corinthians 15. The first 11 verses, we said, really deal with the gospel. It really doesn't deal with any significant problems here. It just pretty much is restating the gospel and what they had believed in to, to be able to come to this point as followers of Christ. It was a rallying point, and we'll talk about how Paul crafted those first 11 verses in just a moment. Verses 12 through 34, he's now going to get into the problem of the resurrection itself. He's going to deal more with the Lord's resurrection there, and uh, then he, he, he ends up now dealing ultimately at the end of the chapter, verse 35, what through, is it 58? Through verse 58 to end that chapter, he deals now with the bodily resurrection of each one of those individuals in Christ and what was going to happen to them uh, after their death. And we'll really simmer down, hunker down, slow down when we get there and spend some time. Uh, very valuable, I think, it's, it's going to be just to refresh our memories on what does actually happen to us when we expire, when we pass, when we die from this mortal sense in our, in our human bodies, and where do we go? Are we hovering in this holding pattern until it rains and enough people pray us into heaven? Uh, are, are we in a transitory state? Or, or do we just immediately go with Jesus? And then what are these references about when Jesus returns? Our bo the bodies will come forth, and how does all that tie in? And what's that referring to? 
And so we'll just have a really great time as we come to the end of this chapter as well. Now, last week when we ended, we're on the last little bullet here on these cultural beliefs of the day. And I gave you four or five of the big driving simple facts about what different groups first century believed when someone died, what happened to their bodies. And let's just refresh our memories about that. I think I talked to you about soul sleep. I think we talked a little bit about termination. I think we talked a little bit about, well, maybe the best uh, subheading, I, I think this is what I gave you last week, absorption. And really absorption forked off, didn't it? For instance, we'll talk about the Stoics in a moment. They're, they're part of this belief. Part of the absorption was reincarnation. You know, the pastor likes to call that recycling. <laughs> that we die and we're remade and we come back in some other form or fashion, Right? But there's also another group that believed in absorption that each one of us are created with a little spark. For instance, the Stoics believe that, that God was a, a God of fire and that when we were created, each one of us were given a little ig ignition spark. And when you die, that is absorbed back into the deity. God gets that spark back. We're reabsorbed. He created us, therefore we return to him. Dust to dust, ash to ash, ground to ground. He created us, we return to him. And that's another form or belief of absorption. And then we, of course, jotted down eternal life. The Christians were the only ones to believe in a bodily resurrection, if you will, a, a, an eternal existence with God himself. And, and so those were some of the things that we jotted down. But what we didn't have time to do, and we got to, and we got to talk about this quickly, is this last little element. And here is really what's going to set up the reading of God's Word in just a moment. So I want you to tune in. Some of you have kind of drifted. I want you to come back with me now. Very important. Let's talk finally about this. What were some of the bodily and spiritual resurrection views of that particular day? And uh, you know that when we get here, I throw on the brakes because I love history. Some interesting things were going around, going on, circulating. You need to be aware of them because much of what Paul's writing is what directed to help the church, duh, 1 Corinthians, the church at Corinth with what they're dealing with. Whether it's doctrinal information or applicable information, the point is Paul's trying to help. Now, most Christians that I've encountered do not, I think, understand fully and do not interpret chapter 15, especially the first 11 verses, correctly. We assume, and boy, you, well, we won't get into that. We assume that they don't believe in any resurrection, that they don't believe that Jesus was really resurrected, they do not believe that when they die one day that they'll be resurrected unto the Lord. That could not be further from the truth. The issue in Corinth, as we read the text in just a moment, I'll be sure to drive that home for you from the text, was not that they didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. They couldn't have been saved without that understanding. More on that in a moment. That's not even what Paul's directing his comments to. The issue, here we go again, is that the Grecian culture, understand the Roman teachings of the day. Remember, remember, they thought all matter was evil. And so, and we'll get to that. It's called dualism. We'll get to that in just a moment. But understanding that, We've got to be able to process in our own hearts and minds. The issue was they let that philosophy come into the church and what many of these believers had drawn the line. We believe Jesus had, was resurrected. That just happened a few years ago. We, we, we still got too many eyewitnesses running around here to, that, that saw it. <laughs> they believed that. But what they did not believe, they felt like that's where it ends. Nobody else is going to be resurrected unto the Lord, not, not me, not you, 
Not the rest of the folks here in the First Baptist Church of Corinth. That's where they drew the line in the sand. Well, where did they get that kind of thinking? Well, the beliefs of the time. And again, let me, let me prove this to you. Would you turn, let me show it to you in the text. Would you turn to Acts 17, just real quick. Acts 17. If you'll remember, Paul left at one point the suburb of Corinth to move into Athens directly. If you remember, the philosophical hub of the first century in Roman Empire days was what? A city called Athens. Do you remember these verses? And there they had the great philosophical debates, didn't they? All the Harvard and Yale men of the first century arrived there. If you had any kind of philosophical teaching, then that's where you presented it. If you had any scientific papers... You would present it in one of these special arenas of intellectualism. And we have this, a little segment of this recorded. Many of you are familiar with it, but we want to zero in on what the content was. Why? Because that will prove to you uh, at least one great source that, hey, pastor hadn't been drinking. He, 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 he may be on target here. Look in verse 16. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens... He was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. Paul's got both barrels ready. It's not time for him to speak yet. He's roaming around Athens, and he's just shaking his head. Like, man, what kind of filth? What in the world? What is this culture, first century, coming to? Then the Bible goes on in verse 17 and says... So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as those in the marketplace day by day, and with those who happened to be there. Paul didn't just go to the floor to have conversations. The Bible says, even in the process of getting there, he's having these conversations and teaching in the synagogues, in the marketplaces. He's stopping meeting and talking to people three, four, five at a time. He's conversing with them and sharing with them and getting feedback from them. And, and, and look, in verse 18, interesting, here we go now. A group of Ep Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them ask, now what is this? Now I'm reading from the NIV, you reading from the King James, you have a little different slant on this. All same content. What is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, well, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news. What's the word for that? The gospel. Gospel means good news, doesn't it? He's preaching the good news about Jesus. Up, 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 up. What's this? And the resurrection. There it is. Paul's trying to hammer home in a countercultural movement. Let me tell you about bodily resurrection. Now, just for the sake of time, jump down to verse 32. We're not done. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead. Now, did you, did you notice when it kind of comes to the end of this little scenario? We... We had three things listed up above. He was telling this, this, this. <laughs> Look at what's highlighted. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them, I'm, I'm looking, NIV says what? Sneered. We have sneered, jeered. I said, what was the King James? Somebody's got King James. Mocked. They mocked him. All right? It's like, man, you're nuts. Here, As Romans, we don't... We don't believe that. No one should believe that. This old body, this decaying body, it's, it's filthy. Anything physical and matter, it's filthy. We don't want to take this with us. The soul they believe lived on, but not the body. And then the end of verse 32, but others said, huh, we want to hear more, or we want to hear you again on this subject. How have I done on setting this up for you? Have I laid it up on the table, on the plate for you, where you're starting to get a feel? What separates, I think, the greatest of scriptural teaching is 
to bring you to the place that the Holy Spirit allows you to feel what's happening. Unfortunately, we weren't there. So the best thing we have is the Holy Spirit that guides us into his word. And if we can start to feel that and sense that, it makes a big difference. I think it would bid you well in the margin somewhere just to write down what are we talking about here. And that is philosophical dualism. Dualism is nothing more. By the way, who was kind of the author of dualism? You know this, Plato. Plato, the remarkable philosopher for the Romans, he, he came up with this dualistic theory. Plato said the body is, a, quoting, he says the body is a prison that binds the spirit. So think about this. Millions of Roman citizens believed what? When you died, whoo, you were freed, baby. Out of that old body, leaving that thing behind, so any hint to bodily resurrection talk, but dude, that was going to be running against the current times 50. They also believe, though, that everything spirit, dualism, two parts, dual, body was bad, spirit was good. They believe that's what went into what? Immortality. Only your spirit will live. Now, another great philosopher of the day by the name of Seneca said this. He was a famous Greek spokesperson. He says, it pleased me to inquire into the eternity of the soul. Nay, to believe in it, I surrendered myself to that great hope. Again, in history, we're able to pull up these tidbits and see that the, the prevailing thought was this. Something happens to one's soul, it lasts, it endures. They had a big divergence on what happened to the soul, but they believed it lived on. But when it came to the body, <laughs> don't want to hear any of the body talk. We're leaving that old thing behind. Partly because they mistreated her body so horribly. I mean, not just sexually, they filled it with all kinds of drugs and orgies, and chaotic stuff. And, and, and so it was just, a, again, Plato was right on target when it came to Roman thinking. Man, the quicker we can get freed of this bondage of this body, whew, the better off we're going to be. Now, before we get through and move into the text, two more groups historically. Jot them down somewhere in some white space. Stoics and then the Jews themselves. The Stoics believed that God was spirit, that actually God was a fire. Do you remember us talking about that a moment ago when we talked about absorption? I said there's those that believe in reincarnation, and there are others that believe when we die we're absorbed back into a deity and that God was, a, was fire and that we each were created with a, a spark and that spark would turn back to the blaze, so to speak. That was the Stoic thinking. Man was a spark of deity, of his flesh, and a little piece of that uh, that God created returned to him. And then we know that in the, even in the Jewish community there was pushback. Many of you have heard the little saying, Sadducees. Why were they sad? Because they couldn't see the Sadducees. But they didn't believe in a resurrection. So even within the Jewish community, there were little sects not S-E-X, S-E-C-T-S, -E that these groups of people, even in the Jewish community, that believed, by the way, they didn't believe in angels either. The book of Acts teaches us that. They did not believe in any bodily resurrection, and they did not believe in angels, the Sadducees. So these five little bullet points at the top are things that you and I are going to need to know. Now let's grab our text, finally. <laughs> Pastor, hush up and get to the text. Here we go. Now, brothers, verse 1. You've forgotten what chapter we're in. 1 Corinthians 15, okay? Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. The gospel, he says what? That I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. The King James, I believe, 
uses the word moreover to get this chapter started, doesn't it? The NIV and some other translations use different words. NIV uses the word now. I've pointed out to you as we study God's word from time to time, some transition statements, some words, like if we were to have furthermore, that would be a reflective word. Uh, the writer would want us to what? To go back. Hey, I, it's a continuation. I want you to think back. But this is clearly a picture in Paul's writing that we're moving on. New subject. Moreover, now, we're, we've got some other things to talk about. So immediately, as a reader, we know that. Now, look at this emphatic statement. From the Greek, I just can't emphasize how big a statement this is. He says, I want to remind you. Let's see, what King, is King James, I made known, or something like, maybe it's American Standard, but one of those, I made known. <laughs> I want to remind you of something. And it's emphatic. What does emphatic mean in the Greek language? It's what? Like our exclamation. Emphasis. I want to remind you of something. I've told you not to go out in the street at 5 o'clock on Judson Road. <laughs> two, two kinds of kids, quick and the dead, remember? So... You don't want to go out there. You're not quick enough. You stay over here with my mom. and You drive that home. You make that a point. You make that a point of emphasis. And Paul is setting up the argument. What, is he, what argument is he going to set up for us? The one that they all agree on. These first 11 verses, he's not going to attack the problem. He's going to spend these first 11 verses reminding them there is one thing that we're all together on. We all are together through our belief and salvation that our Lord was resurrected. And that's where he's headed. He's not going to deal with the problem yet. That's going to be further along in our chapter. Look in verse 2. He says, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word, word I preach to you, otherwise... And boy, this is, this is so hard to translate. Uh, this, this could have been a four-hour conversation with Dr. Farrell here. Otherwise, here it is, you have believed in vain. What Paul's saying is what I preach to you, what, I, what you're standing on, and what you were saved by, what Paul's going to do is start un unfolding the basics. Now, on our outline... This first subheading that I want you to jot down is this. Paul is going to unfold now in these verses that the first standard bearer for the truth of the resurrection, especially now focused on the Lord Jesus' resurrection, is given, the evidence is given by the church. These people, these people in Corinth are actually testimonials of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look in verse 3, again, these basics of the gospel. Here, here they are. Let's just unpack them. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, one. There it is. There's number one. According to the scriptures, that he was buried. There's the second part. Two, he was buried and that he was raised from the dead on the third day, there's the resurrection, there's part three, according to the scriptures, and what Paul is doing is he's unpacking the gospel. Now let's just throw the brakes on for just a moment, and let's, and let's talk about this. Let's don't just skim by, but let's dig our heels in here for a moment. Because our, maybe I shouldn't identify them, one of the groups here in Longview that's worshiping that parades around and says, you can lose your salvation. This would be, oh, it would be on way on down on their list, but this would be in there. You see, they would say in verse number two, you see, even the great man that y'all hoist up as the theological genius of the New Testament, they would say, see, this proves, verse two, that a person could lose their salvation. So let's just deal with that first. Is that what Paul said? 
Is Paul saying here in verse 2, hey, now, some of you, you're saved by the gospel message that I preached to you. Paul wasn't saying it had to be a Pauline gospel. He was just speaking here of what? In terms of the accuracy of the truth. In fact, he spelled it out in those three dimensions. The sin element, that Christ died for us, he was buried for us, and he arose for us. He's just reminding them of the basics. But this, this, but this statement that follows that, what a challenge. Now, go with me for just a moment here. When we're saved, did you notice that the first thing Paul says here, before any of us could be saved or any of them could be saved, they had to what? To receive the message. Salvation always starts with receivership. That's a very important picture. I mean, we're about to fly some folks to Brazil. We're going to have uh, prayer time with them, I think, this week and send them off on spring break. And Man, they're, they're, outside of Malawi, Brazil's been such a fruitful area for Oakland Heights Baptist Church to put boots on the ground. Rick and Jill Thompson, our IMB missionaries, were here with us this Christmas. And, man, they'll be helping lead Pastor Kevin and our team over there. And it's, it's just remarkable. But whether they're speaking through an interpreter in Spanish, it, it doesn't matter. Or if they're, we're speaking Zahili over in Malawi <laughs> through a translator, it, it doesn't matter. The point of this is no one can become a follower of Christ without what? Receiving the message of the gospel. It has to start there. I mean, if someone neglects it, they're not going to be saved. If someone rejects it, they're not going to be saved. First and foremost, they've got to receive it. Write down John 1.12. Gosh, what did we spend three years in John? <laughs> man, don't, man, don't take me back there. But John 1.12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? The children of God. Did you notice that Paul gives us another picture here of what true salvation is? Not just receiving it, but did you notice? Paul says, and you what? You stand on it. You're firm on it. Did you see that in verse 2? It's, it's a picture that you're standing on that. And you're, uh, look at the end of verse 1. You have taken your what? Your stand. You have accepted the Lord Jesus, much based on the fact that he resurrected out of that tomb, was raised up to life, in order to what? Show his power and authority over all aspects of this world. Not only did he conquer your sin in the shedding of his blood, but he has shown his superiority as God himself by this resurrection. He rose. And part of your belief system is based on that. You can't rip that out. Romans 10, 9 tells us, hey, remember we talked about this Sunday morning. You, you've got to what? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also got to, you've got to what? You've got to profess upon what? His death and burial and resurrection that he is Lord. If you're here today and, and you don't believe in the resurrection, it's impossible for you to be a Christian. There's, there, there's no way possible. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, my friend, you're, you're tragically misguided. The resurrection is the corner post of the Christian doctrine and belief system. For 2,000 years, people have tried to disprove it. They tried to mock it. They tried to cause belief problems with it every generation, but they can't do it. Too many people saw Jesus. The Word of God speaks into people's hearts and the truth marches on. Man, if you can't say amen to that, you, you're not going to amen anything in your life. I'm just convinced of that. Receive it. Stand on it. Now, notice this. He tells us right here in verse 3, he says that, 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 that we also have a picture, what? That we are still being saved by it. 
He says, for I received, as I passed on to you his first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Look in verse 4. That he was buried, that he raised on the third day of scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. You began to see a picture here in verse 1. You've taken your stand. Verse 2, that, hey, you believed. And now we begin to see a picture that he's saying, hey, you now are what? You're possessors of this. This is a continuation of your salvation. It's like you, you, you received it, you believed it, you stood on it, you've even defended it, and now you have that as a possession. You are a possessor of God's incredible gift of salvation. And by the way, that's a what? Continuing tense. That is an ongoing picture that Paul is painting. Now, this dealing with the end of verse 2, hold fast. Let me, let me just quickly, I did a little background work for you. Say thank you, Pastor. I did a little background to save you a little legwork. I pulled up everything from lexicons to all. I got on mounts. I, I got on gateway. I looked at all the translations for you. I, I think I got 21 translations. That's impressive. I got it down to three ways. This could be, this, these are the three basic ways that all the translators state this. Now, we just read the one at the end of verse 2 in the NIV. You have believed in vain. You see that? One set of translators make, make this the focus. Because your faith is worthless. Another grouping, you have believed without effect. And then the third big grouping that had three or more translations that kind of fit into a category, you've believed with empty faith. And you and I have got to understand something. This is important. Boy, this is important. This is important. Paul's not saying that for those that have received the gospel, they stand on it and they possess it that their salvation can ever be taken away. Paul is just continuing to teach what he's always taught, and that is there's going to be a group of people that say they believe, that say they're, that they're, they're possessors, but their faith will not last. Well, why won't their faith? Why is it worthless? Why is it without effect? Why is it empty? As the NIV says, why have they believed in vain? Write these two words down. Your New Testament is, boy, I'm fixing to wear you out with it. Uh, maybe 15 passages here, I'm fixing to roll for you. Understand, in our New Testament, there's always a dual picture of what we call, now, now stay with me, presumption and assurance. Assurance we know what God says he will do in each of our lives when it comes to our salvation, assurance. But there's also what we know that offsets that of what? Presumption. We know that we've got to what? Receive it. There's some things we have to do. And so constantly there's this polarity of struggle in our New Testament that, hey, will some faith last? What, 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 did God not offer these people assurance? And what, what's the... What's the standard there? Let me assure you, based upon what we're studying on Sunday morning, let me read it to you. This is the same guy that wrote these words. The same man that wrote these words in 15.2. You don't think he believes in the security of the believer? Listen to these words and take three guesses where it came from. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And if God is the one that justifies, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, 
is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Woo! I get excited about that. Does that sound like a man that, that believes your salvation can be taken away? Doesn't sound like it to me. So what does this mean? I mean, I think I got you excited enough now that you would buy in to say, yeah, pretty sure that Paul believes and teaches in the eternal security of those that are really saved. Well, I hope so. Our whole destiny depends on it. If you think we're going to hold on to our salvation, man, you are deceiving yourself. He's the one that holds us in a relationship of salvation unto him. And I'm so glad because we're too weak. We'll get too feeble. Our mind may desert us in the last days of our earthly life. We may not remember who we are. We may not remember our own kids. We may not remember our spouse. We might, we might rem- forget there's even a God. Boy, in those moments, if that ever happens to you, don't you hope that your salvation is being held by the powerful, all-omniscient God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen to Romans 5. 9 and 10. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him? For if we were God's, if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son and having much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through life. The Bible starts to paint us a picture, especially when we come to our New Testament that lets us know there's going to be a lot of people that believe. A lot of people believe there's a God. Through every generation, every hundred years, another group of people rose through, let's say. Think about that. We're on, we're on our, what, 21st group of people, 23rd, not everybody lives to be 100, I got it. But just, 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 just think, let's just say 25, 26 generations since first century gone by. Every generation, think about this. There are people in that generation that said they believed in God. They said they believed, but in the end, their faith was in vain. Their faith was worthless. Their faith ended up not being authentic. Now, where the rubber hits the road. Well, Pastor, how can that be? And now we're a little bit unsettled to be sure that we're not in that category. Praise the Lord. Let the Spirit seeketh. Let's paint the picture of what it is to have worthless, useless, non-committal faith. Many people, again, believe in God. But what is it that makes their commitment, well, worthless? Remember James? Even the demons, what? Believe? They shudder? They tremble? They don't have faith in God. They don't have salvation. They don't have the eternal existence with the Lord. But they believe. Well, jot down a few things. Do you remember John 2? John 2 is a chapter where it's divided into two pieces. Jesus performs his first big miracle. Do you remember what that was? Turns water into, go ahead, wine. You remember that? And many people, well, there the big driver was what? First part of John 2. The disciples believed. Those guys that were on the fence and started following, the Bible says the disciples believed, buddy. When they saw that, man, that that closed the gaps for them. But you go on down in John chapter 2, and Jesus goes in into this uh, Passover feast. Anyway, he's teaching, and he's doing some different miracles miracles there. And Anyway, here's the statement. End of John chapter 2. Many believed on his name. And do you remember what follows that? You think, whoo, what a great revival of souls. Not so fast. Yes, sir, Mr. Don, that's exactly right. The Bible says, and Jesus never committed himself to them because he knew their hearts. Wait, 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 wait. You're preaching there. Let's say 300 people come and the the disciples are swamped. We believe you. We praise the Lord. And so, look at all these people that came to be saved. At the end of John 2, Jesus slips off 
But before he does, the Bible lets us know he looked out across that group and he didn't receive them all because he knew. He knew that there were those that what? There were those that were not committed to them. You see, real salvation is faith that's sustained through a belief system. And Paul uses the word here in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm standing on it. I'm standing on it. Well, in Christian magazine, they've come out with a new thing. I'm standing on it. I'll read any article. But you'll not shake me from the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. My destiny depends on it. My Savior has conveyed it, and he died for it. I will not be shaken. Now, that's a, that's a different place than 50 children coming forward in vacation Bible school. Man, we hope all 50 come. But we got to be careful. Jesus says, seed. Some of that seed that's sown out there, some of it falls over here, four, three or four categories. Hard ground, birds get some of it. Some of it falls, comes up a little bit, sun dries it up. But some of it falls on ground and the roots go deepest. And it takes root. There's the picture in our New Testament over and over. John 8 Jesus tells people, even as he spoke, many believed in him. John 8, 31 says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, wow, you are really my disciples. That's what Jesus himself said. If you hold to my teaching. Think about Luke 8, 13. You remember that parable of the sower? The rocky ground we just talked about. Let me read that verse. The rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe in it for a while, but the time of testing, here it is. They will fall away. Are you starting to get a better picture now? A big holistic picture of what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about assurance of the believer. He's talking about the fact that there's going to be wheat and tares. I hope that's not the case in this gym today. But we wouldn't know at this point. But there will be a point for the, for what? The tares, you will fall away at some point. And Paul is suggesting to us, our New Testament in totality teaches us, hey, people that fall away, they were never, they didn't have true faith to begin with. True faith, you receive it, Remember? True faith, you accept it and you stand on it and you will not be shaken. You keep hold of it. Write down Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. But my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who, listen to this, shrinks back. Boy, there's an interesting way of describing the same concept we've been talking about and mulling over. Shrink back. But... We do not belong to those who shrink back. We're not brothers and sisters with those shrinkers. They're no part of our family. Now, they've eaten lunch with us. They toted the Bible like we did. They gave a little money to Lottie Moon this Christmas. But you know what? When it comes right down to it, they're no brothers of mine. They're no brothers and sisters of ours. They're shrinkers. They're not standing. Wow, what a picture. They fall back. Remember James 1.22? Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do, you see, be a doer. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, here it is, goes away, shrinks back, in other words, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But here is the zipper of everything for me. Write this down. I think this is one of Paul's masterpieces. 
Listen how that same concept is described for us in Colossians 1. And let me read three verses to you. Let me read verse 21 and 22 first. Paul says in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Well, we know what that is. When we were lost, darkness, evil, bad, bad place. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ, Christ's physical body through death and present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now here it is. Get ready. Man, this is fantastic. Verse 23, if... You continue your faith. Wow. I love that. If your faith is real, it will continue. He went on to say, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become your servant. Last verse, 1 John 2, 19, one of your favorites, pretty well known. They went out from us, but they did not really what? They didn't belong to us. John 1, 2, 19 goes on to say, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed us that none of them belonged to us. Sooner or later, our faith is tested and tried, and it will be shown to be what? Valid, or in that process, will shrink away. It will not be genuine. It will not stand the test of time. And I just wrote down the church itself then, isn't it? Isn't that what Paul's saying? He says in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, isn't that really what he's saying to the people at Corinth? Look, look at yourselves. You are people that received the gospel. Here you are. You've received it and you're standing on it. And how else could all of these people in here, different colors, different nationalities, different dialects. Some of you came from oceans abroad. Some of you were are farmers here. And, and what has our God done through his resurrection, that power, his overcoming, his sovereignty is our God. He has transformed us where we're all meeting in one location and we have one symbol of unity and that is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And following that cross, the cornerstone of it all was they did not keep Jesus in that tomb. He what? He came forth. And again, 2,000 years, skeptics, the cynics, the scholars, they've tried to disprove the resurrection and they have not been able to do it. And you know what's really exciting for me? Right over there on those rubber mats, we saw it in this service again this Sunday. Every time we see someone baptized, people are once again seeing a real life picture of that what? The resurgence of that resurrection coming up out of that water. You down in death, but raised to walk in newness of life. Every time there is a baptism, we're reminded of how important that is. Well, I'm a little disappointed. Number one, I'm a little disappointed because you're not more excited. <laughs> and you're not sweating like I am. <laughs> and the other thing I'm disappointed about is I had made intention to be through both these top two elements today. So that proves to me that you didn't listen fast enough today. Quickly, our schedule. Next week, We'll be right back here, same outline, even though you've got coffee and food stains on it, bring it back. We've got four more big elements in these first 11 verses to talk about, about the proof of the resurrection, of our, our common unity. Next week we'll do that. 15th of March, we will not be meeting spring break. That's dead week for us. Mission trip team people are gone, our kids are out of school. No more at midweek. And then the 22nd. Our sixth anniversary for more at midweek. We've got the menu plan, incredible. Music, getting, getting keyed up. Going to have some incredible music that day. 
and we're going to teach God's word that day and just celebrate six years of more at midweek. And I just again want to thank you. You look around this room. Many of you are the core group that moved with us from that chapel six years ago. There were what, eight of us, <laughs> whatever it was. And God just continues to bless. Many of you are coming from other churches now. Many of you are bringing your friends. So really reach out on the 22nd, even if they don't want to come back. What a great day to expose them to what we have and what we cherish here at Morton Midweek. Not anything physical, but the opportunity we have in Koinonia, in fellowship with one another, and to huddle around God's Word in the midweek time to give us that boost of energy that we need for the rest of the week. Let's pray. I send you to lunch. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to open your word today. Thank you for the faithfulness of so many of these. I mean, they could fill their lives with all kinds of fun things and crazy things to do. And, and Father, yet they, they carve out week by week this time so that we can huddle around the word of God, let it speak into our hearts and lives. Father, our outward man may be wasting but not our inward man. Inside of us, you are rekindling. You are rejuvenating. You're reinforcing. You're driving home principles that we need to hear over and over because when we pass over, when we journey across to meet our Lord, Father, we want to be ready. We don't want to limp across. We want the Lord to carry us across with full vigor, looking forward with great anticipation to seeing Jesus. Father, we love you. Thank you again for protecting and preserving your word so that we will have it. And thank you for letting us hide it in our hearts. These things we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great lunch. Have a great